Well, praise the Lord. I want to welcome you this morning to the Prophecy Watch radio program. What a blessing it is each week to come to you and open up the Holy Word of God and look at what God has said, would happen, and then read where it did happen. Amen. God has prophesied things and uh, His Word is truth and it always comes to pass. Last time I was with you, I just showed you a couple of uh, prophecies dealing with Christmas. We looked at Matthew chapter number 2. That's all we looked at. We didn't... There's so many other prophecies. I can take you in the book of Psalm and show you about 60 prophecies dealing with the first coming of Jesus. I can take you to Genesis and give you hundreds of pictures and typologies and prophecies dealing with the first coming of Jesus, yet people were not studying it. How do I know this? Because there was nobody, I said nobody, in Bethlehem waiting for the Messiah to be born. The angels had to go out and get the shepherds. And the shepherds went into the city of Bethlehem, the Bible says, and the, and, the, and the shepherds got people out of their homes. And the people in Bethlehem went out to see the Christ child. I mean, there was nobody waiting. All we had was we had an old woman named Anna and an old man named Simeon of the tribe of Asher who was waiting for the Christ. But where's, where's the hoopla? Where's the birthday cake? Where's all the singing? Where's all the, the fireworks, so to speak? Where's all the excitement? The Messiah is to be born. The time had been given. The city had been given in Micah chapter 5, verse uh, 2, I believe it is. So the city's given. The time is given in Daniel's uh, prophecy of 70 weeks. I mean, it's it's time for the Messiah, and nobody's there. Nobody's even looking in the peers. That's what we talked about last week. And that's been disturbing me all week long. All week long. Jesus was laid in a manger. Why was he laid in a manger? We don't know. You know, the Bible doesn't say, so we don't know, you know. Um not affirmative that we can just say this is the reason but I tell you I tell you I think I, I know a few reasons see in that manger it's open to everybody if Jesus would have been born and and taken and placed in a gold and silver bassinet and put down in the Bethlehem Hilton hotel it would have been under lock and key There'd be no shepherds coming in there. There'd be no normal people coming out of the city. These people that came out of the city were unshaven. They were unbathed. Some were uncouth. Some were little children. All ages, all manner of folk. The manger made it open for anybody in the world to come by and see the Christ child. And there he was. The chickens saw him. The cows uh, saw him. And the 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 shepherd, uh, the sheep saw him. The goats saw him. All the animals in the barn area saw the Christ. He was open for everyone and everything. Now watch this. The message I want to bring to you, and I'll try to be quick. But at the same time, I'm just so full. I'm about to pop. Listen to me, please. Give me a few moments of your time. Listen to this. I want to call this message from the manger to the bushel basket. From the manger to the bushel basket. You see, two years later, see the skies lit up with angels saying glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Goodwill to men. People saw it. People worshiped. The shepherds came to the to the place. The people of the city came to the place. Then the Bible says, and suddenly there was a heavenly host, 
a heavenly host. How many is that? I don't know, but it's a lot of people. Heavenly host of angels singing, praising God in the highest. That took place in Bethlehem of Judea. That took place, my friend. And two years later, Jesus is now out of that manger. And you would think that he is the talk of, you hear me? The talk of the town. You would think everybody in 50 miles heard of it, knew of it. Some of them saw the lights. Some of them saw two years later when the when the wise men and, the, and that angel uh, light or whatever it was shined over the house. It was, this should have been the talk of the town. But when those wise men came to town, and they came to Jerusalem four miles away, nobody said nothing. Nobody said, oh yeah, man, right down the road, right over there, right down the road. The sky lit up. Man, it, it, it was like daylight in the middle of, the, of midnight. Oh man, there was angels flying all over the sky, screaming and shouting, glory to God, playing trumpets and singing songs. What are you talking about? You talk about something awesome. You're just right down the road four miles. You can't miss it. That's what should have happened if everybody would have kept Jesus in the manger. If everybody would have kept Jesus in the place where everybody can see him, everybody can talk to him, everybody can worship him, everybody can know all there is to know about our saving king. But oh no. Oh no. Nobody knew anything. Everybody was tight-lipped. Everybody was quiet. And I want to ask you this morning. A lot of times when I do Bible studies, no matter what topic it is or what book in the Bible it is, I start my Bible study with, where is Jesus? Is he the lamb in this story? Is, is Jesus the good shepherd in this story? I, no matter what story in that Bible, I will find Jesus first. And then, and then because you find the devil right next you know, to him, and then I want to find myself. Where am I? Oh, you're, you're that little lost sheep. And Jesus has left the 90 and 9 over there in Luke. Jesus has left the 90 and 9 safe and he's gone out in the highways and the byways and the low places because he, he sits on high, but he looks down low. And he sees me in my lowest esteem. He sees me in the lowest places that I can get myself into and the worst trouble I can find myself in. And he comes to me and he grabs me and he holds me. And he saves me over and over. Not salvation, but just saving me. Saving my life. Saving my health. Saving my ministry. Saving my marriage. Saving my... He is a savior. He is a savior to you. Listen to me. Get off that drug. Get off that junk. Get off... The, let Jesus save you. He... There is no addiction more powerful than the Son of God. There is no name under heaven. Well, we'll call it cigarette. Or we'll call it dope. Or we'll call it fentanyl. Or we'll call it Budweiser. We'll call You call it what you want to call it. But there is no name given under heaven more powerful than the name of Jesus. He can take away the sin. He can take away the addiction. The Bible says that there's no name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. That's Acts 4 verse 12. Philippians 2 verse 9 and 10 says, For he is highly exalted, and every knee shall bow before Jesus. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus is the Lord of the glory of the Father. Listen, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is your answer. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something. I want you to go in your in the room and wake up that, that, that young boy. Wake up that young girl because I got a message for him before, before I close. I want to give them a message that God put in my heart. 4.30 in the morning last night, he, he put it in my heart. 
And I promised God I'd do my best to deliver it. So go wake up that boy. Wake up that daughter. And say, I want you to hear something. It won't take but just about two minutes. But someone wants to say something to you. Someone wants to give you some hope. Someone wants to lay a name on you. Somebody wants to talk to you about Jesus. Somebody. So go get him. I'll wait a moment or two. We looked last week in Matthew chapter 2 of the miracles. I just named a couple. And even in the fact that Herod killing those babies was already forecasted in the book of Jeremiah chapter 31. Everything that was done was done prophetically. Everything. And if you look at just to look back down at Matthew uh, chapter number 2, you'll see that when Jesus comes back from Egypt, he's about a little over two years old, he comes back from Egypt, and Joseph is concerned because Herod is dead, but Herod's son is ruling Judea. And so he was concerned, and God warned Joseph and said, don't take the child of Bethlehem, move him up to Nazareth. And then the Bible says, so that it might be fulfilled that he would be called a Nazarene. You see, every movement. Take him down to Egypt because the Bible says, I shall call my son out of Egypt. He went to Egypt for more. I mean, God could have snapped his finger or blew his nose and Herod would have fell dead. God could have stopped Herod, but he didn't. He let Jesus run down to Egypt to fulfill scripture. Folks, don't dismiss prophecy. The Bible is more than, I, I, I quote people who say that the Bible is a third prophetic. I, th I think it's at least half prophetic. Every, every other word you read, like even in, in, in where it says that, that, that not one bone was broken on Jesus, that it might be fulfilled. They broke the bones of both thieves on the cross. And they come to Jesus to break the bone to hurry up his death and said, nah, he's already gone. See, they think it's their idea, but it was prophesied that they wouldn't touch his bone, wouldn't break his bone. Everything in that Bible, I'm telling you, everything has a reason. It's not some old dead, dusted up, dried up, forsaken old book. It is a living word of God, and it's always up to date. It's always pertinent for the season, for the time. It tells you what to do, tells you what not to do. We have kids nowadays going to proms, and, and, and they dress like a slut, and mama and daddy seem to be okay with it. Many a young person, many you hear me, you hear me, I have been preaching since 1977. That's when I was licensed. And I was preaching before then. But from 1977 to today, I have seen and heard of so many young girls coming home from what they call a prom, a promenade, coming home from what they call a prom, pregnant coming home from dates with these wild boys, wide-eyed, full of hell, pregnant. See, the devil knows, and God knows, and God sees. God sees exactly what's going on. God knows exactly what's going on. The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 11, that God knows Every thought, then it emphasizes and says, every one of them. You can't hide from God. You can't lust and smoke that dope and do all the things you do and think God doesn't see. God is so good and loving and he doesn't maybe not punish you that day or punish you that night if you're a Christian. He may not get a hold of you for a few days, but you better hear this preacher. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also 
reap. Yep. Now, the young boys and young girls that may be here listening, I want to I give you a word. As I said a while ago, when I do Bible studies, I find myself in the story. I want to find Jesus in the story. Let's back up to Christmas. Let's back up one week from now, okay? Let's back up. Here we go. Back up. Matthew chapter number two. We're backing up. You ready? Come on, big guy. Come on, big guy. How much do you bench press over at the football club at the Red Bugs? About 350, 375. Did lift about 500. Hey, man, that's, that's, that's a fourth of a ton. That's a lot of weight. You're a big boy. You make stouts tough and rough. You can handle a few minutes of a preacher, can't you? Yeah, sit, sit with me. Sit with me for a minute. I want to talk to you. Now, let's find, let's find you. Let's find you. You ready? All right, so the shepherds go into the city, and the shepherds tell the people in Bethlehem, the Christ child has been born. The Savior is right over here. And if you want to see the Savior, you can walk over there and put your eyes on the Savior of the world. He's just right over there. He's just right there. You see all those angels in the sky? Right below those angels. There he is. Go see him. So here you go. Maybe you're 10 years old. Maybe you're 11. Maybe you're 9. And you walk down there with your mom or with your dad. Maybe you go by yourself. And you walk over there and you look over into the manger. Opened up for everybody in the world to see. And you see his eyes. You see his hair is going to be plucked, cut, pulled, his brow beaten. You see his cheeks is going to be cut when they pull the beard. You see those hands is going to have holes in them and the feet and ankles is going to have nails driven. You see him. Yes, you do. Maybe you even have a love for him. I'm giving you benefit of the doubt, brother. Young girl, young cheerleader, or just young student, you see that baby Jesus and you fall in love with him and say to yourself, I have seen the light. And you change your ways for a little while. But something happens. Something happens to you, young people. First thing you know, you take him out of the out of that manger where all your friends can see him. You, you, you take him out of the manger where your lost buddy can see him and you hide him in a bushel. You hide him in a bushel basket. The Bible says we're the light of the world and you, and you don't hide. You don't hide a light. You, you don't hide a light under a bushel basket. How in the world can you hide a light on a city on a hill. Listen, Jesus died on a hill. Jesus actually was born on a hill. The elevation of Jerusalem and Bethlehem, that's all hilly country. He's born on a hill. Did ministry on a hill. Preached sermon on the mount. Died on a mount. He, it, it was open and obvious for anybody to see Jesus. And here we are. Now, I'm going to ask you your testimony, young man. Well, I'm uh, 6'3". I weigh uh, 290 pounds. I bench press 375. I deadlift 500. Uh, uh, I don't sit on the bench. I play football for the Red Bugs. I'm rough and I'm tough and I'm mighty and I'm strong. Yeah, right next to you, big guy. Right next to you is the locker. Is another guy. He's 6'2". Or 6'3". He's dead lifting 450. He's following in your footsteps. You're his icon. And when it comes to Jesus, is Jesus open? Is Jesus in the manger for him to see? Is Jesus talked about? Is Jesus praised? I dare say no. For the most part, what I have noticed in the schools and classrooms is that people 
never talk of Jesus. Jesus is hidden away in, in, in a bushel basket. There's no light to shine. And when party time comes, it's Smirnoff. Or it's Jack Daniels and all that other hellish stuff. Let me tell you something. Whiskey and beer and all that whole crowd, that is a demon. Make sure you hear what I'm saying. Well, what about so-and-so? He's going to get mad. I don't give a rotten foot if he gets mad. I'm telling you what the Bible says. The book of Proverbs says that liquor is a serpent and then calls it an adder. That means it's poisonous. And you run out there as a big old tough, rough guy or you run out there as a young girl wanting to be in the crowd and you begin to smoke on junk and sniff on stuff, hide stuff from the principal, hide stuff, and then take it. How many of you have friends, you young people, how many of you have friends that's died of fentanyl or other drugs? You okay with that? If, if, if Everything good with that? Do you know that we have 27,000? Write that down. 27,000 more bartenders than we do preachers. You say, well, I don't like that guy on the radio this morning. I don't like him at all. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You'll probably go to a bartender. You'll like him. Because there's 27,000 more bartenders serving hell and serpents and snakes to kill you than there are preachers trying to help you. And I dare say, I'm talking to the pastors now. Pastor, if you got a pulpit and you're not telling your kids about liquor and alcohol, the Bible says, listen to me, preacher, you don't even know this, I bet. I bet the preachers don't even know this. Do you know preachers that drunks go to hell? Sir, do you know that? Preachers, you're not preaching it. You're not preaching it. Why? You're letting your kids go to hell. You're letting your, 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 your church go to hell. You don't even care enough or you're too scared. You're such a coward. I'm talking about these big old rough boys being cowards. They won't tell their friends about Jesus. They keep Jesus in a bushel basket. Well, that's what you're doing. Or you'll talk about the flood a little bit. You'll, you'll talk about David and Goliath a little bit. Oh, you, you'll talk about Adam and Eve a little bit. Or you'll talk about this story, that story, and yonder story. But the principles of God and the doctrines of God, and when God says, Thou shalt not, you leave it alone. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says that drunks go to hell. Do you understand that, preacher? If you understand that and you're not preaching it, you need, you need to retire and get right with God before you come back. Now that's my message for you. That's my message for the whole new year. And I want to say this openly because I've already said it on Facebook. I intend to go after liquor. I intend to go after liquor. I can't do nothing. I'm just one guy. But I'm going to every store that I know. I said every and if they're serving liquor, I'm going to go talk to the manager. And I'm going to ask him, what would it take for him to take that liquor down? I'm going to ask him, if a tornado came through here, would you get rid of your liquor? If a fire came through here and burned this place, would you get rid of your liquor? If you got cancer, would you get rid of the liquor? What would it take? For you to throw this devilish snake down. What would it take? Thousands. Thousands according to the website Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. M-A-D-D -D dot com. Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. 450,000 since they started counting. Did you hear that number? That's right at a half of a million. Young people, dead in the pulpit, is so sissified, so impotent, so weak, it won't put its foot on the neck of the serpent 
Yes, sir, I'm talking to you. If the shoe fits, wear it. You talking to me, Brother Joy? You better know it. How dare you be a preacher of the gospel and not preach all of it? Preach about Adam. Preach about Eve. Preach all the stories, but make sure you get all the other things that Jesus said that will send you to hell. Liars go to hell. Any sermons on lying lately? Amen, amen, amen. Hey, I'll amen myself. Now my time is gone, so I'm going to get off. I'm saying it strong, and it may say, well, he don't like people, or he don't love people. Let me tell you something. I stopped on the side of a road in Moss Bluff, Louisiana. Drunk driver ran into a teenage girl. And me and another man that worked for an ambulance service, we picked, we picked glass out of that girl's eyes. She was screaming, there's, there's stuff in my eyes. And when we looked with our flashlights, it was glass from the windshield. Let me tell you something. One of my best friends was killed by a drunk driver. And it happens every day. Every day. Every day. So, yep, I'm going down here to Walmart. I'm going over here to the, to the stores that sell gas. I'm going over here to Sailor's Groceries. I, I'm going to Warren, to Easy Mart. I, I'm going to every store that I know and tell them what the Bible says. Book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, says, Whoa. Well, I don't want no God woe on me, do you? Woe to the man who gives his neighbor drink. Now, young man, young girl, I wanted to, your mom and daddy get you out of bed to hear this. You are strong and you are young and influential. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, you know what? I love Jesus and I'm proud of Jesus. Why don't you take Jesus out of that basket and put him out there for anybody in this world to see. Why don't you walk around with Jesus on your sleeve? Why don't you walk around lifting those weights, pulling up those weights? Why don't you walk around with Jesus all over you? Why not? Are you a coward? Are you scared? I'm scared. Are you scared, really? Big old boy, big old stout football player? I'm scared. I'm scared. Why don't you be a man for God? Why don't you grow up, bow up, and serve Jesus? And I'm talking to all of us. May God richly bless you this morning. May God help you. May God help me. Please pray for me. I know that I'm going to be hitting some obstacles. I know that i got some problems coming. But I'm going to start my new year up with getting Jesus out of the box. I'm going to get Jesus out of the basket. I'm going to put Jesus back on display. And if anybody comes four miles from Joey Lizenby, they're going to know where Jesus is. They're going to know all about Jesus. Amen, amen. May you have a rich, beautiful, glorious Sunday. And again, keep Jesus out of a box. Keep him out of that basket and put him on display. I pray that God will bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.